بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد أي لهبة في الله Imam Babahari Rahmatullahi said in the 34th Mas'ala or 34th point in his book قال وَمَنْ خَرَجَ الْإِمَامْ مِنْ آيَمَةُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فَهُوَ خَارِجِي قَدْ شَقَّ عَسَى الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَخَالَفَ الْآثَارِ وَمَيْتَتُهُ مَيْتَةٍ جَاهِلِيَةٍ Imam Babahari Rahmatullahi said that whoever rebels against the uh, Muslim ruler is one of the Khawarij. And he has caused dissent within the Muslims and has contradicted the narrations and dies a death of the days of ignorance. Jahiliyyah. The Khawarij ayyul habitu fillah, the Khawarij are a group who first appeared in the time of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhum. They split from his army and they began the grave innovation of takfir, declaring Muslims uh, and rulers or the ruled in their view guilty of major sins to be disbelievers. The Prophet وسلم, warned against him in many authentic ahadith. The Khawarij are the dogs of the fire. The Prophet وسلم, said, Al Khawarij Kilab al Nar. And uh, reported by uh, Ahmed in his Sahih. He also informed us that they would continue to appear until the end of the world, saying, A group will appear reciting the Quran, but it will not pass beyond their throats. Every time a group appears, it is to be cut off until the Dajjal appears within them. And this is reported by Ibn Majah, and it is Hassan. And there's many uh, ahadith of the Prophet وسلم, referring to the Khawarij. Something very important as we've uh, covered this in uh, Aqidat Wasati and also in this book, some of the narrations. And you can go to Sahih Muslim, uh, the chapter uh, of leadership, Kitab al Imara, and you'll find countless narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu about the importance of not rebelling against the leader, hearing and listening and obeying the leader, and that it is not permissible to rebel against the leader unless that the leader has clear and open disbelief, which you have proof from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as is clear. It's very clear there's no ikhtilaf bain ulama, there's no uh, uh, ta'wil or anything present. So the conditions for takfir would be in place. And some of the ulama have detailed along with that issue arises another mas'ala is when is it permissible to rebel against the apostate leader or non-Muslim ruler. And again, this issue to make it very short, without going into the details, because I don't have any of the text, but Ben Baz uh, wrote fairly extensively on this, detailing this issue. But one of the things that we have to realize, and this is with many uh, Messiah in Islam, m many issues in Islam, is that these issues, مبني على مصلحة ومفسرة, that they are issues which deal with the harms and the benefits. So basically, one of the things is that you have the qudra. This is for your uh, ibadah, for your worship. To do an act of worship, and of course if you were rebelling against the leader, you would do it out of obedience to Allah. Meaning if the leader was no longer a Muslim, it was clear. The ulama, uh, the scholars and the, 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 uh, the qudat, the people, who, the judges and stuff, it, it, it was clear that this leader was no longer in the fold of Islam and was harming Islam. And they made the pronouncement of takfir with his conditions, and they looked at the mu'ana, the things that prohibit from making takfir. Then this issue arises, when is it permissible? Is it just permissible now that you made takfir to rebel? Of course not. This is where the ulama, why you need the rasikhun of al-ilm, those people who know uh, the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they know the Quran, they know the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they are the mujtahidun, they are the ulama, rasikhun fil ilm, min ahl sunnah, 
and they know the maslaha and the mafsada. They know the harms and the benefits in these issues. They can look at these masahil. They look and make tatbik. They make it. Uh, they make it practical. They take those texts. They understand those texts. They understand the history. They understand the fiqh. And they make those rulings and apply those rulings on the waqa', on the situation at hand. So then they look and they say there is a greater harm or there is a greater, there's a greater harm in trying to overthrow so and such and such ruler, if that is the case. That it's going to lead to fold, that it's going to lead to uh, just countless bloodshed. And let's just give a practical example. Look at the situation in Iraq. And Iraq is a, is a classical example. Even Somali is also another example. That, okay, some of the ulama, they pronounce takfir of uh, Saddam Hussein. Some of the major scholars. I know uh, in my reading and listening, uh, I've heard and read ulama like Ben Baz declare tek, make takfir of Saddam Hussein. And uh, uh, Imam Muqbil bin Hadi al Wadi as well, Allah yarhamahuma. And other than them, Kathir, because he, for, for their reasons, without getting into all the details, he was his Ba'ath, he was uh, basically a communist, nationalist, Ba'athist, who preferred that over the religion of Islam, etc., etc. And so they made takfir of him. But they did not encourage the people from any knowledge that in any fatah or anything that I've read and heard to rebel in that situation in Iraq. They didn't say overthrow him. They made takfir, said he's a disbeliever, he's not in the fold of Islam, but they did not encourage the people to rebel because they knew the strength that he had. His army was strong, his spy system was strong, his intelligence apparatus was very heavy and strong. So they didn't encourage the people to rebel. But then you have non-Muslims, you had the United States of America, you had, and the UK, unilaterally deciding to go against the the world community and overthrow Saddam Hussein and, and then kill him and, and so forth and try him. What is tremendously problematic is at least under that wicked Shaitan uh, is there was stability for the people. There was fear, yes. There was evil. There was oppression, yes, yes. But we have to look, was there, was it better then or is it better now? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We would have to ask the Iraqis to say, but what we do know is since his fall, since 2003 or whenever, and now it's 2014, in these 11 years we have seen thousands and thousands, perhaps in the hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, decimated daily. Hundreds slaughtered, beheaded, tongues cut out, uh, women blown to pieces, old men, their whole heads blown off, heads cut off, beheaded. The point being is there's no normal normalcy in life. And I tell you, no matter how much you can sit behind your computer and look at the YouTube channels and get excited about ISIS and other groups and whatever, that if you have not been in those type of situations, you cannot appreciate peace and stability as those people majority of the Iraqis Shi'i and Sunni and other than that would appreciate just normalcy having schools for their children and not having to worry about car bombs being able to have a functional government where there's power and water and supplies without being blown up not being fearful in checkpoints and stuff so, forth. so the point being is the chaos that results from rebelling or overthrowing the ruler, those things have to be looked at. There are Dawabit Shari. This is the beautiful thing of the Sharia. And even in most world logic, these principles are there in fact, of looking at the harms and the benefits. These are common principles. These are Sharia principles and they're human principles that are even uh, even non-Muslims look at these issues. When they look at policy, they look at the harms and the benefits of doing such an action to the best of their ability. We don't know the outcomes. We don't know sometimes the good that may come out, but we can only look at the duabit of the shara, the criterion of the sharia, to deduce those matters. 
And what we see in the case of many of these countries, Libya, look at Libya still in folder and chaos. The militias killing and slaughtering. They, they remove Qaddafi. So you have to look at, is that better, more beneficial for the Dawah? Is it more beneficial for the people there? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But I do know people all over the world like stability. No one likes to live in a war zone. Ask the people of Philistine right now what they're going through with the Yahud, with the Jews who are bombing them without mercy, being supported by America and American bombs and others. Those people want normalcy. So the point being, although we've gotten off track, the point being here is that these issues relate to the harms and the benefits these harms and the benefits are determined by the ulama, the rasikhun fil ilm. And that these things have a dawabit, they have criterion in the shara. And that rebelling against the leader is something that Ahl Sunnah is united upon. Qadeem wa hadithin, you know, in the past up to now, the salaf of this ummah, that it is not permissible to, rule, to rebel against the leader and those who rebel against the leader are generally they are of two types of people either uh, Imam Baba Hadi said in a very strong statement he said that they are Khawarij so either they are Khawarij or they are rebels because we know that Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he was asked about making takfir of the Khawarij he said radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said we don't see that they are uh, outside of the fold of Islam, but we see that they are rebels. This is to paraphrase loosely what he said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And that's how the ulama, they looked at that some, you know, some people may not share, maybe they are doing this aspect and fitting in the khawarij in that sense, maybe they don't make takfir. So it's not a creed issue for them, but maybe they rebel for some other reason. So in this situation, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, these people would be considered re rebels. And they are dealt with in accordance with the sh sharia. They're fought against and they are uh, uh, to be tried and, and executed for that. As well as the khawarij as well are to be fought. But the, the sharia distinguish in the ulama in the past and up to now they distinguish uh, between the rebels and the khawarij. So Imam Baba Hari mention that whoever goes against the Imam from the Imams of the Muslim then he is Khariji and he has divided the uh, main body of the Muslims and he goes against the Ahadith or the Athar of the Salaf and he will die the death of the people of Jahiliyyah so I have to fill out this is very important An another mas'ala that comes up which is something very interesting that Sheikh Rabi mentioned in his Sharh, Hafidhullah Ta'ala. He mentioned in this aspect of the treaties something very beneficial. He, he mentioned this mas'ala and then he gave a, 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 a brief jawab or an answer regard. He says, Yani, men kharaja ala khalifa, wa fi had al asr ma fihi khalifa. Fima hakama ta'adid hadihi al bay'at wa hadihi al uh, Imar, Imara, uh, uh, the Sheikh said that uh, whoever in describing what Imam Baba Hari was saying that whoever goes against the Khalifa the leader of the Muslims and then he mentioned that in this time we don't have a Khalifa although we have people who are trying to arise and trying to form a Khalifa that they want the people to rally behind them but of course, the people are not rallying behind them. The Muslims everywhere are denouncing them. Uh, he mentioned that in this time we don't have a Khalifa, which is well known. What is the ruling regarding these various bay'at? Because if you go to many of the Muslim countries, they make rulings like here in Saudi, Saudi Arabia and other countries, especially in the Gulf countries, that they make the bay'at to their uh, to their leader in their country, to the king in their country, or the prince, or whatever, in their in the various Muslim countries, he said, "What's the ruling regarding this?" And he said, he mentions that ulama like Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, 
uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, Imam Shokani, and other them say that it's okay, it was permissible to make uh, more than one bay'ah, meaning not that you make bay'ah to various groups, but that there will be bay'ah, uh, the bay'ah to a particular leader in the particular locality, meaning the ruler who meets the criterion of being a ruler and having the bay'ah. So, there are many great Imams from before, like Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Sheikh Islam Muhammad Ibn Wahhab, Imam Shokani, uh, and other than them, who said this. And then he also said, وَمَنْ whom Ahmed bin Hanbal, Imam Ahmed, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik. So, three of the great Imams also said, because during their times, there was also, the Muslim world was already split up into various, uh, into various um, rulerships or, or places that, that were ruled, kingdoms and, and what have you. And so the bayat was given to various rulers regardless of whether it was the, uh, he mentions Al-Andalus, he mentions Jazair like uh, Algeria, he mentions that in Tunis as well, and many places uh, that there were uh, that there there were various leaders of various states, small states, and that the ulama of those states and people of those states took the bayat to their particular leader, and that those great imams agreed with that in absence of a khalifa, and so all of the rules apply as far as making jihad behind them, praying behind them, hajj behind them, regardless of whether they are righteous or wicked, as we've already mentioned uh, in the previous uh, sitting. And these are just some of the benefits the Shaykh mentioned. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.